Well, we say good evening to you. Good evening. Uh, we greet you in the strong name and majestic name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Uh, we thank God for those of you viewing us from home, from your smartphones, from your laptops, from your uh, tablets. We pray uh, that you would feel the presence of God even as we worship in a different way on a different platform. And so we are here tonight, not for any shape, form, or fashion, uh, not to entertain, but to worship the one true God, our Lord and our Savior. And so tonight we are thankful uh, for these ministers, our deacons, our diaconate team, and this wonderful music ministry. And we're going to hand it off to them. They're going to lead us in praise and worship, and then we'll come back in the study of our word, of the word, we'll be looking at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. Music ministry, would you worship our God? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We thank you, God, for this opportunity, God, to enter into your presence. And we know that you are good in spite of everything that we have come through, God. We know that you are good and your mercy endures right now, God. Thank you. 
these things. But in all things, help us not to trust you. Remain steady in you. Because we know if you did it before, you'll do it again. You brought us to go, God. And we know you'll bring us through again, God. There's nothing worth more. No thing can compare. No thing can compare. No thing can compare. Hallelujah, Jesus. Your presence, Lord. Let's try it again. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more.
certain times, God, we pray that your people would know that you are yet a certain and sure Savior. And Father, for those who don't know you yet as Lord and Savior, we pray, God, that you would save some. God, we pray that you would prick the hearts of those who have yet to come in but still belong to you. Father, we pray that you would grab our attentions, that you would arrest our cardias, that you would grab our hearts, God. And that in this moment of darkness, that your light would be able to shine the bright. That you'd be able to give clarity where there's yet confusion. Father, we pray that you bless our time tonight. That you would be glorified. And your people edified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And every heart says amen. 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 Amen and amen again. It's good to... Be, just be used by God and to man, know that God is real and not to have to take anybody else's word for it, uh, but to know it for ourselves. On tonight, we uh, begin a study in the book of Hebrews, uh, beginning in Hebrews chapter 1. And we understand that the book of Hebrews is written to show the superiority of Jesus Christ. 
over everything that preceded him, over the law, over the prophets, and all that came before him. Uh, this book testifies that Jesus is God. This book testifies that Jesus is God's Son. Yes. This book unites the Old Testament and the New Testament in ways that help make it clear. There are yet people who are unclear and uncertain about the deity of Jesus Christ. Yes. Well, I pray that as we go through this study in the book of Hebrews, that it'll just become clearer. Man. And I'm reminded that Scripture says about itself that some things are just spiritually discerned. So, Father, we pray that even as we study tonight and through our remaining time through the book of Hebrews, that you would just illuminate, that you would just reveal yourself clearer to us, God. And so, tonight, we begin at verse 1, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, uh, and it opens this way. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. It's interesting uh, how this book opens up. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, this points to the continuity of what was said and what was written in the Old Testament and shows how it connects, how it lines up with what we read today in the New Testament. Right. It says, it talks about how he spoke long ago to the fathers, uh, to Abraham, to Moses, to, to Jacob, uh, to Isaiah, uh, to all the prophets who came before. And, and it talks about how God, he spoke to them and they speak to us. But it says that he spoke to them in many portions. None of them prophesied or told all that was to come. All of them spoke what he gave them for their specific season and for their specific portion and for their specific assignment. And it's amazing how even in that God shows how he uses whom he wants to use for a specific period of time, for a specific purpose, and for a specific revelation. Amen. It's amazing that none of them got the full revelation. All of them got it in parts and in portions. And it's amazing how God, through the many years, doesn't, doesn't paint a picture uh, that's ragged or incomplete, but all of it is congruent or connects together to tell one complete and compelling story that is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. It says he, he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. God doesn't just move in one way. Matter of fact, our God is so amazing that I, my grandma used to say that, 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 that God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. God, our God is amazing and is not limited by our thinking or what's finite. Yeah, yeah he, He's not bothered by time, by recession, by depression. He's not bothered by anything. And all that he desires to come to pass, man, God just does it. We trust God. We have faith. But yet there are moments, even with our faith, that we yet have fear. Yes, amen. amen. And I'm so glad that God helps us even when we have fear that we can still move because our faith is not on what we can see or even what we can understand. But our faith and our hope is built in this eternal God yeah. who is able to use people in different seasons over several years to tell a compelling story that points to him. It says that he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. But then verse 2 says, In these last days has spoken to us in his son. Yeah. Now, that, there can be no question who his son is. It is crystal clear who the son of God is. The son of God is Jesus. Jesus. 
Now we know that because this is a Bible. And all of the Bible point to God's Son being Jesus. So it says, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. It's amazing that even in the language, the, the language defies our ability to compare God to anything that is known. An heir points to somebody that will be left something because they were born into a specific family. And we know that Jesus is the son of God. But there's a difference between Jesus, the son of God, his birth, and every other birth. We know that Jesus didn't show up in the birth of Mary into, until the New Testament. But this says, in verse 2, the latter portion through whom also he made the world. So Jesus didn't just show up in the manger. He, he didn't just show up in Bethlehem. He was here from the beginning because he was there when the world was created. So we don't have a kind of God who is created. We have the kind of God that is a creator. And God in his infinite wisdom allowed God in the person of Jesus Christ to, to manifest physically in a manger in Bethlehem. But this text tells us that that's not, that's not the beginning of his existence. And so this helps us to understand that this, this son, this, this Jesus cannot be just a man. He, he, it's impossible for, for this Jesus to be just a man and for him to show up physically in the New Testament, which we know there is a 400 year period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This, 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 this God man was here in the beginning. When was the beginning, preacher? It was in the beginning. And whenever the beginning was, God was there in the beginning. There was no beginning without God. But God was not created. God was the creator. God so loved us that even after speaking through the fathers a long time ago in many portions, in many ways, loved us so much that he now speaks to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, for whom also he made the world. Now, just these first two verses smack every other religion around who have other thoughts of who Jesus is. Or who, are, who have other thoughts of who the Son is. This clearly, if you read it in this context, explains that this Jesus is God's Son and this is the vehicle and the vessel who God desires to use to speak to us. Yes, amen. But it says, and he is the radiance, being Jesus, God's son, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Mm -hmm. He used others to minister in their season in many different ways, but to minister in portions. Okay. But none of them is it mentioned that they are the radiance of God's glory or the exact representation of the nature of God. They have attributes of God. They, they speak what God gives them, but they are not the exact representation of God. And then it says, and upholds all things by the word of his power. That's why when times are uncertain and we need, man, good advice, good information, nothing ought to supersede the word of God. The word of God still speaks because the God we serve is a living God, and this is his living word. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, Verse 4, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. This is part of the reason we don't have to pray to angels. 
Amen, guys. We don't have to pray to angels or other created beings. Because this text tells us, verse 4, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. The reason we don't have to pray to angels is because Jesus is our Savior. Yes, Jesus, Jesus is who completes our sanctification. It, it is Jesus who fulfills our justification. It is Jesus that allows us to be righteous. It is, it is Jesus who allows us who have some sins, maybe one or two or three or four, but it's Jesus, or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten, but it's Jesus who makes us just. He makes us righteous. It's not that we were not guilty. He has declared us innocent yes. through the shed blood of his son, Jesus the Christ. Yes. Verse 5 continues. It says, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? None of them. <laughs> None of the angels did he say that to. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. He said that to none of the angels. He only says that about his son. Who was the son? Jesus. The book of Hebrews is an apologetic all by itself. Folk want to argue with you about the deity of Christ. Turn them, turn with them to the book of Hebrews. And just tell them to read. Don't even explain, just tell them to read. And the, the word has a way of fighting better than we can. Amen. The word has a way of arresting the logic of others. It has a way of arresting the cardia of others. Because might I, might I put a pen there? Because our hearts weren't always right. Amen. And it was the word, it was the person of Jesus Christ that arrested our cardia. That, that saw us going in the wrong direction and redirected us. And so it, so it is the word of God that will do the same thing for our brothers and sisters that may be in an error of going in the wrong direction. Yes. In fact, that's really the purpose of apologetics. Not to win the argument, but to win the person. To help them to see the dysfunction in their thought pattern. To help them to see the illogicalness of their logic by looking at the Word of God, by seeing what God says about it. Amen. Don't follow me, follow the Word. Amen. Don't tread with me, tread with the Word. Amen. Don't trust me, trust the Word. Trust the one who was here in the beginning. Who is the son of God, who God decided to use to now, now to speak to us so that we would know better than we knew in, in days past. Yes. Amen. Just by way of clarification, in verse 2, it talks about in these last days. These are yet the last days. Okay. Right? So the last days he's talking about in his this historical context. Is the same last days we stand in now. The last days are the time in between the resurrection of Christ and the time that he comes back. So these are still the last days. Some folk look at how long a gap it is between the resurrection of Christ and the rapture of Christ and think it means that God is slack on his word or that God is, is, is not able to perform what he said. But the reality is that, 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 that God is delaying his return so that others can come in. So that others can know him. And for whatever other purpose he has, just God is suffering. Yeah, God doesn't have to check in. He doesn't have to give us his itinerary. He doesn't have to tell us everything on his mind. He doesn't have to explain himself to us. But even in that, he is still gracious to us. The Bible says, and plenteous in mercy. There's enough that we know about God that we can busy ourselves just doing the stuff we understand without wrestling with the stuff we yet understand. Everybody want to be deep, just be obedient. <laughs> just obey what you know. <laughs> uh, if you can't add, don't be trying to do division. If you can't round, don't be trying to do long multiplication. Start where you are. And God will be able to Allow you to progress to where he wants you to be. Yeah, we don't study the Bible so we can brag and beat our chest about how smart and how intelligent we are. 
God don't just call the intelligent. He calls those who are willing to listen to him and to follow him. In fact, that, that was kind of the problem with the Pharisees and Sadducees. It wasn't they weren't intelligent. In fact, some would say they were too intelligent. And that's, I think, some of the problem with our brothers and sisters that are atheists and agnostics. It's not that they're not intelligent. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not that they don't have any intellect. They just outsmarted themselves. Oh. Right. They, 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 they outsmarted themselves. And it's amazing to me how you can pick up the word of God and see all the wonder and the splendor and the beauty that all God has created that there is no real rational explanation for and you land on that there is no God. It takes more faith to believe that there is no God than to believe that there is a God. Because there's more evidence for the existence of God than there is that there is not a God. More things are explained by believing in the presence of a God than there are explained believing that there is no God. In fact, nothing even makes sense if there is no God. Suffering doesn't make sense if there is no God. Pursuing holiness, pursuing right living does not make sense if there is no God. But that's not what we are tonight. We, we are believers and we pray those tuning in tonight. If you're not one, we pray that you are here to become one. Amen. The word continues to testify to the fact that Jesus is superior to everything that came before him. That those things that came before him really point to him. And now that God is speaking through his son. Verse 6, verse 6 says, and when he again brings the first point into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. This continues to show the distinction between God's son and created beings that God uses. Because verse 6 says that when Jesus was born into the world through the Virgin Mary, it says that the angels of God worshiped him. Yes. Then verse 7 it says, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, which means that God sends them where he wants them to go. And they serve and they minister according to what he tells them and where he sends them. Then verse 8 says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Showing the superiority of God's Son, Jesus, to the angels. That's why it don't make sense to pray to angels. If Jesus is superior than the angels, well, there's no, no middle person to pray to. To clog up my prayers, I, I, need, I need you now. <laughs> Quick, fast, and in the hurry. I, I, I don't need nobody fumbling over it. Like, you know what? I, Jesus. <laughs> One of your children called me last week. And not forgot to say, no. You, you can go straight to Jesus. Yes. If my grandma was here, she'd tell you, you can call him. Yes. He is on the main line. Yes. And you can tell him what you want. Yes. This is pointing to how far excellent Jesus is beyond the angels. Yes. Verse 9 says, you, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. He doesn't call any of the angels God with a capital G. But this he says about his son. And you, Lord, verse 10, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all will become old like a garment and like a mountain. You will roll them up like a garment. They, all, they will also be changed, but you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. It's 
sound like this son, this son of God is a bad somebody. It's a bad, you better shut your mouth. We serve some kind of God who is well able to deliver in any and every kind of circumstance. And this points to how God is not limited, how Jesus is not limited to finite things. That God, that Jesus is beyond this world's constraints. There's nothing constraining my God. There's, there's nothing constraining your God. There's nothing that he cannot do. And so even when we're bothered, even when we're uncomfortable, even when it feels like things are out of control, even when it feels like we're falling and we don't know how to get up, Jesus is the one yes. who will pick you up. Yes. This text testifies to the holiness of Jesus, how, how the otherness of Jesus, how, how Jesus is Man, far superior to anything that we can put a name on or put a tag on. He, he defies our vocabulary. He defies our intellect. He, he defies our, our emotions. That's why sometimes we can't even say that we just wave our hand. Sometimes we cry and there ain't nothing to cry about. We, words just don't express, man, how awesome this God is. Not because somebody else told us, but because we've experienced him for ourselves. Now, yes, somebody did tell us about him before we came to know him for ourselves. But the way we feel about him now is not based on secondhand information. It's based on firsthand information. The wonderful thing about a God who is this kind of God is that he is mindful of little old us. He allows us as dirt to come and talk to him. It, 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 it's amazing that one who is all powerful allows us who, man, who depend on him for our very being yes. to come talk to him. Yes. And not just talk to him, but to ask him questions. Yes. And sometimes we perturbed when folk we think beneath us come to us with questions. And oh, how patient yes, yes. this God is with us. Yes. Looking at the superior nature of who Jesus is helps us to take a closer look and examine our interactions, to be a little more gracious in our interactions. Oh, we may have titles and positions and folk may know our name, but none of us are like this Jesus. None of us have a capital G in front of our name. But all of us need the capital G every minute and every hour. This, this, this talks about uh, uh, how Jesus will remain. How heaven and earth will pass away. But his word will, but, but his person will remain. It says in verse 12, and like a mountain, you will roll them up. What? The heavens. You'll, you'll roll them up. I mean like a paper towel. You, you, you ball, ball it up. Like a garment, they also will be changed. But you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. This created stuff will come to an end. This stuff that we work so hard for, it's got to come to an end. These relationships we spend so long building up, this, this great name, this great reputation that we spend, oh man, tons of energy crafting and perfecting and protecting, it'll soon pass away. It, it, it'll soon be gone. But this Jesus who is the Son of God, his years will never, never end. Verse 13 says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? None of them. <laughs> Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So I want to pray to angels because God has already given them directions. It's God that's directing the angels 
to be on post for us and to be watchful for us all night and, and all day. The angels keep watching because God has given them directions. You know why we can't direct the angels? Because we don't know enough. <laughs> we don't know where to tell them to go. We'll leave here in a few minutes, but we don't tell. We can't tell them what to meet us at. We, we can't tell them what the next issue will be that we'll have. We can't say, hey, meet me in such and such. I feel like it's going to be a problem. We can say that, but we probably be off. God is a much better director and orchestrator, and it's God that sends the angels. We don't have to pray to the angels. We, we pray to God that directs the angels. It says that the angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Preacher, who will inherit salvation? Those who are born again. <laughs> you don't work for salvation because the text says that we'll inherit it. Amen. Inheritance is not based on work. Right. It's not based on you being real good. It's not based on you fitting in. It's not based on, it's not based on how many times you've done good. How much money you've given. It's based on you being in the family. Yeah. Care how good you are. If you ain't in the family. Somebody had written your name on it. You won't inherit it. The good thing about this is that God decides who is in the family. Yes, and the litmus test of who is in the family is who will believe, believe on him. Amen. The word declares to those who believed on him, he gave the power to become the children of of God. And thus becoming children of God, because we believe on him, we inherit salvation. We receive salvation. It is certain. It's not something we wondering about. It, it, it's certain. Because somebody did that. And the somebody was Jesus, oh, by the way. <laughs> On an old rugged cross, he did die. Yes. And he has paved the way for us to inherit salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who we're talking about tonight, the son of God. Yes. And whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Yes. That's, the, that's really the sole reason that we preach that we would continue to believe on him and to have faith in him. This book of Hebrews is, is written um, because the Jews, man, were so fickle that they were trying to err and go back to Judaism, going back to the law and to the prophets. And this book is written to them to tell them, hey, what you got in Jesus yeah. is greater than what you had yes, in the law and the prophets. Yeah. It's all right being, being Abraham's son, but it's even better than an heir of the king. Yeah. So he said, hey, hey, what, where you started was good, mm. but it's not where God intended for you to stay. Preacher, how do you know? Because anything living has to grow. Amen. Amen. Great, great. Good God. And stuff that's not growing probably ain't living. Yes, amen. D2 is two years old. He wears toddler clothes. But in a little while, he'll outgrow toddler clothes. He'll be older than two. He, he'll grow. He won't understand the way he understands now. Not only will he physically grow, but his understanding will grow. God accepts us where we are, but then he helps us to move to where he wants us to be. Yeah. He, he helps our understanding. That's why we understand him better today than we did when we first accepted him as our Lord and Savior. Yeah. We don't have to understand everything about God when we accept him. We just have to believe him. Right. And believe in him and place faith in him and know that he is the only man. Jesus is the only name given among men by which we must be saved. 
There is no other name that saves. There is no other name that delivers. There is no other name that has the power that Jesus' name has. And so lest we in 2020 get caught up in trying to be so intelligent and cute and woke and trying to go back and understand and reestablish Old Testament norms. For what? Right. The ones who got the message first couldn't keep it. Their children who they taught it to couldn't keep it. The children after them who got it couldn't keep it. So how do we feel like so far removed yeah. that we can keep it? But it's not even necessary. Just accept, accept the freedom and the liberties that come with being a child of God. Then the Bible says don't use our liberties as a license just to live any kind of way. And the reason we don't live any kind of way, even with our freedoms, is because we are children of God. Yeah. We represent our Father. We are trying to be, we are seeking to be about our father's business. Yes, That's why we have to read his word, not, on, not simply on Tuesday nights or just on Sunday or Wednesday night, but every day. Because there is a war going on for our mind and for our cardia. And so we have to be reminded of what scripture says. So if folk come up to us with error, we'll know when we hear it. Like, not that I sound. <laughs> That, not, that ain't sound. Turn to the book of Hebrews, <laughs> chapter 1. And it explains that God's son is far superior to everything that came before he showed up. Because everything that happened before he showed up ministered in portions and in parts. Portions and parts are good. Yes, amen. If you're baking a cake, every portion and part that the recipe calls for you have to put it in there. Every portion of the part is important. But none of them are as important as the finished product. Right. Nobody's just eating bone sugar, Amen. pound of butter, Amen. frosted. Right. No, we, we won't get me to change. Yes. In fact, I don't even have to watch you make it. Just call me when it's ready. Yes. And I'll just bask in the evidence oh, of parts. Jesus allowed everything that came before him to be ingredients, to be, to be parts that part to a whole. Yes. Why would anybody want to just have the parts when you can have the whole? Yes. Mm. Yes, sir. The whole is available. Why? Why just some for pieces? Yes. Don't, don't give me just the pieces when the whole is it, but give me the whole. So the text, Hebrews chapter 1, points to the superiority of Jesus Christ, who is God's son, who is the only, the only one that's capable of saving. Our brothers and sisters, we pray uh, that you would read afresh and anew uh, this book of Hebrews as we continue uh, throughout the remaining chapters of this book. And read it with fresh eyes. I know Hebrews is one of those books that's so powerful and impactful. That there are like key scriptures and key verses, key verses that we've heard quoted. But we want to walk through them and read it in its context to make sure we get it right. Anybody can quote just a part of scripture. Uh, but the greater thing is really seeing what the whole is saying. And we just say, well, don't, don't just give me the parts. The whole is available. And Jesus is the great illuminator that helps us to see greater that we carry in this city. Mm. That's why I think for the end is that we're endeavoring to see everything clearly. You know who the great illuminator is? It ain't our optometrists. It ain't lens crafters. It's Jesus the Christ. Amen. You want to see better? Amen. Call on Jesus. Amen. You want a better understanding? Call on Jesus. You want greater clarity? Call on Jesus. Family, we bless you. Bless God's name on tonight. Bless God for you. We pray that you would continue to journey with us and pray, pray with us as we.
endeavor to bless God's people through this new platform. New platform, same God. Amen. New platform, same spirit. Amen. New platform, same word that will meet us here every time we open it. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you again for meeting us here tonight. Father, we pray as those hear and receive your word, your word uh, that you would help them to have a greater understanding of who you are through your son, Jesus. Father, we pray that those wrestling and struggling with the deity of your son, that you would make your word come alive for them. Yes. Father, we pray that during this season that you would allow us to be winsome, that you would allow uh, us to allow your light to shine brighter and greater through us, that those who don't know you will seek to know you, that they will see our works, but glorify you. Father, help us in this season not to just blend in, but to be different. Yes. Not to live for ourselves, but to live for you. Father, we pray that you would help us to be the kind of ministry that draws people to you. We pray, God, that you will empower us to be the kind of people that would radiate the love of Christ. Father, we pray that if there's anybody watching, watching this that are unsaved, that you would just begin to minister to them. We pray, God, that you would send one of your children, God, to help them come to a greater understanding of you by way of accepting you as Lord and Savior. Father, we only invite, but it's really you that, that, that does the work. It's, it, it's you that turns the hearts. But Father, we pray that you would help us to be serious about discipleship and live a life that pleases you and calls others toward a risen Savior who satisfies completely. Father, we pray that as we close on tonight, that you've been pleased with what we've presented to you. Father, we thank you that we're not perfect, but we are forgiven. Father, we thank you for the work of sanctification that has begun uh, when we accepted you as our Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for the completing of the work through the Holy Spirit, yes. that we will look more and more like your son, Jesus, and less and less like the world. We thank you, God. Thank you. We give your name glory, honor, and praise. Yes. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We say amen. amen. And thank God. God bless you. Shalom.